Thank you for watching Hidden Hand, Melchizedek and the Mystery of Fire, Part 3. Part 3, The Sacred Fire in the Spine and Brain. Sand tree called the medulla spinalis cord, spinal cord, the central axis of the nervous system. In a person of average size, the spinal cord is about 18 inches in length, weighs approximately one ounce, and terminates opposite the first lumbar vertebra. The upper end of the spinal cord passing upward through the foramen magnum, the large opening in the occipital bone of the skull ends at the medulla oblongata running through the spinal cord is a tiny central channel referred to as the sixth ventricle this is described as follows it is just visible to the naked eye but it extends throughout the cord and expands above the fourth ventricle in the cornus medullaris. It is also dilated, forming the ventriculus terminalis. Krause? According to the Eastern system of occult culture, there are 49 sacred nerve centers in the human body, of which the seven most important and key centers are placed near the spine at various intervals. The total number 49 is the square of seven and is also the number of rounds and sub-rounds of a planetary chain. When seen clairvoyantly, all of these centers resemble flowers or electric sparks. Each one of the seven main plexuses has six or six of fewer, six of lesser importance surrounding it, thus forming six pointed stars diagrammatically. Although these centers are not arranged in star like order in the body, concerning the continued reoccurrence of the sacred number seven in connection with the organs and parts of the human body, H. P. Blavatsky writes, remember that physiology, imperfect as it is, shows septenary groups all over the exterior and interior of the body. The seven orifices, the seven organs at the base of the brain, the seven plexuses, the foreign pharyngeal, the laryngeal, cavernous, cardiac, epigastic, some as solar plexus, prostatic, and sacral plexus, etc. These seven are the negative spinal plexus of the first importance, but disciples, disciples of the mysteries are warned not to attempt the development of these centers because they are negative poles. All of the real plexuses, which the true disciple of the highest knowledge should try to unfold are located within the skull. For the body is a negative pole of that spiritual body contained within the cranial cavity. As the body is controlled by the brain, the true adept works with the brain, avoiding the negative poles of the brain centers which are located along the spine. <clears throat> Proper development of the seven brain discs or spiritual impenetrating globes result in the awakening of the spinal flowers by an indirect process, beware of the direct process by concentrating upon or 
directionalizing the internal breath towards the spinal centers. Madame Blavatsky might have added to her list of septenaries the seven sacred organs about the heart, the seven ductless glands of first importance, the seven methods by which the body is vitalized, the seven sacred breaths, the seven body systems, bones, nerves, arteries, muscles, etc., the seven layers of the augic egg, auric egg, sorry, the seven major divisions of the embryo, the seven senses, five awakened and two latent, and the seven year periods into which human life is divided. All of these are reminders of the fact that seven primitive and primary spirits have become incarnated in the composite structure of man, and that the Elohim are actually within his own nature, where from their seven thrones they are molding him into a septenary creature. One of these Elohim, which corresponds to a color, a musical note, a planetary vibration, and a mystical dimension, is the key con consciousness of every kingdom in nature. The Elohim also take turns in controlling the life of the human being. According to the ancient Brahmins, the lord of the human race is keyed to the musical note Fa, and his vibration runs through the minute tube in the spinal column. This tube is called the Sashuma. The essence moving through the Sashuma finally blossoms outward, forming a magnificent flower in the brain. This is called Sas Sahasara. Sahasrara. Hmm. The thousand petaled lotus in the midst of which is enthroned the divine eye of the gods. In India, it is impossible to secure inexpensive chromos showing a meditating yogi with these flower centers along the spine connected together by the three nagas, or serpent gods, which represent the divisions of the spinal cord. The cadices of Hermes shows the two serpents wound around the central staff where they vibrate as the sharp and flat notes of the central stem. The Naga gods or serpents often symbolized with human heads sometimes as cobras with seven heads are favorite motifs in oriental art. In an isolated part of the jungle in Indochina stand the remains of an ancient city of Angkor. Concerning the building of which nothing is known, although the natives maintain that it is, its great structures were raised in a single night by the gods, these buildings contain hundreds of carvings of great serpents, most of them hooded cobras, in some cases, the bodies being of great length are used as railings around walls and the sides of steps. In the Indian chromos, the blossoms along the spine are often shown with varying numbers of petals. For example, the one at the base of the spine has but four petals, the next above six. Each of these petals is inscribed with a mysterious Sanskrit character representing a letter of the ancient alphabet. The petals are believed to indicate the number of nerves branching from the plexus or ganglion. The lotus blossoms are often ornamented with the figures of the gods. For all of the deities of the Brahmin pantheon are related to nerve centers in the human body and the proclivities which they demonstrate 
mythologically are symbolic of activities within the nature of man. One oriental painting shows three sunbursts, one covering the head, in the midst of which sits Brahma with four heads, his body a dark, mysterious color. The second sunburst, which covers the heart, solar plexus, and upper abdominal region, shows Vishnu sitting in the blossom of the lotus on a couch formed of coils of the serpent of cosmic motion, the seven hooded head forming a canopy over the god. Over the generative system is a third sunburst in the midst of which it sits Shiva, his body a grayish white, and the Ganges River flowing out of the crown of his head. This painting was the work of an Indian mystic who spent many years on the figures subtly concealing therein great truths. The Christian legends could be related to the human body by the same method as the Oriental, for the meanings concealed in the teachings of both schools are identical. In masonry, the three sunbursts represent the gates of the temple at which Haram is struck. There being no gate in the north because the north, the sun, never shines from the northern angle of the heavens. The north is the symbol of the physical because of its relative relation to the ice crystallized water and to the body crystallized spirit in man the light shines toward the north but never from it because the body has not light of its own it shines with the reflected glory of the divine life particles concealed within the physical substances for this reason the moon is accepted as the symbol of man's physical nature Hiram or Shiram, as he should more properly be called, is as much as his name consists of the letters which in Hebrew stand for fire, air, and water, represents the mysterious, fiery, airy water which must be raised through the three gland, three grand centers symbolized by the latter with three rungs and the sunburst flowers mentioned in the description of the Indian painting. It must also pass upward by means of the ladder of seven rungs, the seven lotus blossoms first described. These blossoms need not be considered entirely from an oriental angle. Christians could properly call them the stations of the cross, for they are sacred places where the redeeming fire stops for a moment on its way to the Calvary to liberation. The spinal column is a chain of 33 segments divided into five groups. The cervical or neck vertebrae, seven in number, the dorsal or thoracic vertebrae of which there are 12 one for each rib the lumbar vertebrae five in number the sacrum five segments fused into one bone and the coccyx four segments considered as one the nine segments of the sacrum and the coccyx are pieced by ten foramina through which pass the roots of the tree of life. Nine is the sacred number of man, and there is a great mystery concealed in the sacrum and the coccyx. That part of the body, from the kidneys downward, was called by the early Kabbalists the land of Egypt, into which the children of Israel were taken during the captivity. Out of Egypt, Moses, the illuminated mind, as his name signifies, 
led the tribes of Israel. The twelve facilities, faculties, by raising the brazen spirit in the wilderness upon the symbol of the Tau cross. At the base of the spine, there is a tiny nerve center concerning which nothing is known. But the occultist realizes that the symbolism of the second crucifixion, which is supposed to have taken place in Egypt, has reference to the crossing of certain nervous and base of the spine. Certain nerves at the base of the spine. A friend visiting Mexico was good enough to count the rattles on the tail of stone Im images of Quetzalcoatl or Colquilcan, as he is sometimes known. In nearly every case, they were nine in number. The cosmic hierarchy controlling the constellation of Scorpio has control of the occult fires in the human body. To symbolize this, they were given the name of the serpent gods, and the priests initiated into their mysteries wore the coiled serpent in the forms of a uraeus upon their foreheads. The priests also often carried flexible staves carved in the form of a snake and from six to ten feet long. The wood of which they were made was specially treated by a process now lost. At a certain part of the ceremonial, the priests bent the flexible staffs into circles, placing the tail of the carved snake into its mouth, accompanying the process of se with secret invocations. The transcendentalists of the Middle Ages did the same thing, but not with the full understanding possessed by the ancient priests. The lords of Scorpio, being the great initiators, accepted none into the mysteries, save when the sun was in a certain degree of Taurus, symbolized by Apis, the bull. When the bull carried the sun between his horns, the neophytes were admitted. In geocentric astrology, this takes place when the sun is supposedly in the last decan of the constellation of Scorpio. This is true not only in the ancient Egyptian rituals, but it is still true in the mystery schools. Candidates for the occult path of fire are to this day admitted only when the sun is geocentrically in Scorpio and heliocentrically, heliocentrically in Taurus. The star group constituting the constellation of the Scorpion closely resembles a spread eagle and is one of the reasons why that bird is sacred to Freemasonry, which is a fire cult. Although the three tubes of the spinal cord are called the, in the ancient wisdom the nagas of whirling snakes and the serpent which cannot die till sundown was accepted as their symbol. The scorpion has also been used as emblematic of the spinal fire. This scorpion was called Judas the betrayer for he is a backbiter carrying his sting in the sacrum and coccyx. We are reminded of the legend of Parsifal for the castle of Klingzor, the evil magician, located at the foot of the mountain in the midst of a garden of illusion, is merely a symbol of this city of Babylon and the land of darkness where all too often the Son of God is tempted to sacrifice his immortality. Here also is the scene which Goeth called Walpurgis Night. It is here also that the false light is chained for a thousand years, as related by 
Milton in Paradise Lost concerning the decent descent of the spirit of fire down the spine into the place of darkness Milton says him the almighty power hurled headlong flaming from the ethereal sky with hideous ruin and combustion down to the bottomless perdition there to dwell in adamantine chains and penal fire it is also from here that the hordes of scorpions rose spreading blight and destruction to all the earth as is related in the book of revelation here also is the rock moriah over the brow of which haram is buried here lurks typhon the destroyer and satan who was stoned this is the dwelling place of the false light to differentiate it from the true light which shines out through the regions of shamayim above between the two lies the length of the spinal cord a rope connecting the ark and the anchor there is a legend among the orientals to the effect that kundalini the goddess of the serpentine spirit spinal fire growing tired of heaven decided to visit the new earth which was being formed in the sea of space she therefore climbed down a rope ladder the umbilical cord from heaven and found an island the fetus in the sea of maru the amniotic fluids surrounded by the mountains of eternity the Corian, all of which existed within a egg of brahma the womb of matra padma after exploring the island the kudalini decided to return up the ladder once more but as she was about to ascend the ladder was cut from above the umbilical cord was severed at birth and the island drifted off into space in fear kundalini ran and hid herself in a cave the sacral plexus where according to certain of the eastern teachings she remains coiled like a cobra in the snake charmer's basket from which she can be lured only by the three mysterious notes of the charmer's flute when kundalini begins to unwind she ascends as a serpentine stream of fire through the spinal canal and into the brain where the, she stimulates the activity of the pituitary body the spine may be divided horizontally into three sections the lowest section includes the lumbar vertebrae together with the segments forming the sacrum and coccyx and is surrounded by a brick red haze of a lurid and angry color this haze is oily in texture and causes the sacrum and coccyx to appear the color of dried blood the color however is living rather than dead higher up toward the lumbar vertebrae the color is somewhat lighter and not so angry looking it gradually turns to orange and through the section composed of the 12 dorsal vertebrae there is a golden glow radiating toward from the thread like line of what appears to be a river of yellow fire these colors extend somewhat outward along the nerves which branch off from the spine between the vertebrae a little higher the yellow becomes flecked with green and through the cervical section the stream becomes faintly electric blue though the ida and pingala two lateral tubes through the spinal cord paralleling the central tube on either side this stream of fire goes up and down increasingly the farther up the fire goes the thinner and less brilliantly its hues but the purer and more beautiful the colors until finally they meet in a seething molten mass in the ponds of the mandula oblongata where the fire begins almost immediately to permeate the third ventricle 
and agitate the pituitary body. This tiny form is described by Santee as follows. The hypothesis pituitary body is composed of two lobes bound together by connective tissue, a sheet of dura mater, diaphragma salae, holds them in the hypophysial fossa, the anterior lobe. The larger is derived from the epithelium of the mouth cavity and in structure resembles the thyroid gland. It is closed vestigial, it's closed vesicles lined with columnal epithelium in part ciliated, ciliated contain a viscid jelly-like material pituita which suggested the old name for the body. The anterior lobe is hollowed out on the posterior surface, kidney shape, and receives the posterior lobe, the infundibulum into the cavity. The hypothesis has an internal secretion which appears to stimulate the growth of connective tissues and to be essential to sexual development. The pituitary body is the negative pole, yet it plays many roles in the development of the spiritual consciousness. In one sense of the word, it is initiator, for it raises the candidate, the pineal gland. Being of feminine polarity, the pituitary body lives up in the, its dignity by being the eternal temptress. In the Egyptian myths, Isis, who partakes of the nature of the pituitary body, conjures Ra, the supreme deity of the sun, who is here symbolic of the pineal gland, to disclose the sacred name, which he finally does. The physiological process by means of which this is accomplished is worthy of detailed consideration. The pituitary body begins to glow very faintly, and little ripples ring of light pour out from around the gland and gradually fade out a short distance from the pituitary body. As occult growth continues according to the proper understanding of the law of occultism, the emanating rings around the gland grow stronger. They are not equally distributed around the pituitary body. The circles are elongated on the side facing the third ventricle and reach out in graceful parabolas towards the pineal gland. Gradually, as the stream becomes more powerful, they approach ever closer to the slumbering eye of Shiva tinting the form of the pineal gland with golden orange light and gently coaxing it into animation. Under the benign warmth of the radiance of the pituitary fire, the divine egg thrills and moves and the magnificent mystery of occult unfoldment takes place. The pineal gland is thus described by Santee. Pineal body corpus pineali is a cone-shaped body, six millimeters, 0.25 inches high and four millimeters, 0.17 inches in diameter, joined to the roof of the third ventricle by a flattened stalk, the habanula. It is also called the epiphysis. The pineal body is situated in the floor of the transverse fissure of the cerebrum directly below the splenium of the corpus callosum and rests between the superior colliculi of the quadrigeminal bodies on the posterior surface of the midbrain. It is closely invested by pia mater. The habanula splits into a dorsal and ventral lamina which are separated by the pineal recess. The ventral lamina fuses with the posterior commissure, but the dorsal stretches forward 
over the commissure in continuity with the roof epithelium. The border of the dorsal lamina is thickened along the line of attachment to the thalamus and forms the stria medullaris thalama, pineal stria. The thickening is due to the presence of bundled of fibers from the columna of the fornix and the intermediate stria of the olfactory tract. Between the medullaria stria and the, at the posterior end, there is a transverse band, the commissura hoblinarlarum, through which the fibers of the stray partially decussate, decussate to the nucleus habunulate in the thalamus. The inferior of the pineal body is made up of closed follicles surrounded by ingrowths of connective tissue. The follicles are filled with epithelial cells mixed with calcareous matter, the brain sand, acivulus cerebri. Calcareous deposits are found also on the pineal stalk and along the chloriod plexus. The function of the pineal body is unknown. Discardes facetiously suggests that it is the abode of the spirit, the sand of the man. The reptiles, in reptiles, there are two pineal bodies, an anterior and a posterior, of which the posterior remains undeveloped, but the anterior forms the rudimentary cyclopean eye in the heteria a New Zealand lizard. It projects through the parietal foramen and presents an imperfect lens and retina and in its long stalk nerve fibers. The human pineal body is probably homologous with the posterior pineal body of reptiles. The pineal gland is a link between the consciousness of the man and the invisible worlds of nature. Whenever the arc of the pituitary body contracts this gland, there are flashes of temporary clairvoyance. But the process of making these two work together consistently is one requiring not only tear, years, but lives of consecration and special physiological and biological training. This third eye is the cyclopean eye of the ancients, for it was an organ of consciousness vision long before the physical eyes were formed. Although vision was a sense of cognition rather than sight in those ancient days. As man's contact with the physical world grew more complete, he lost his inner understanding together with the conscious connection with the creative hierarchies. In order to regain this connection, it is necessary for him to rise above the limitations of the physical world. He must not, however, sever his connection with humanity by becoming a recluse or an impractical dreamer. The occultist must not walk out of anything. He must work out of everything. In the pineal gland, there is a tiny grit or sand concerning which modern science knows practically nothing. Investigations have shown that the grit is absent in idiots and others lacking properly organized mentality. Occultists know that this grit is the key to the spiritual consciousness of man. It serves as a con connecting link between consciousness and form. The foregoing will give brief understanding of part of the mystery of man's occult anatomy. Those with discerning eyes will see in the spinal canal leading upward into ventricles of the brain through certain doors concerning which science is ignorant. The passageways of the chambers 
of the ancient mysteries, they will realize that the spirit of the spinal spirit fire is the candidate who is being initiated. In the triangular room of the third ventricle, the master mason degree is given. Here, the candidate is buried in the coffin, and here, after three days, he rises from the dead. The lower degrees of the ancient mysteries led through torturous passageways were howling and crying rent the air and the flames of the inferno flickered through the darkness. The neophyte seeking for light was first led through the underworld where he fought strange beasts and heard the wailing of lost souls. All this was emblematic of man's own lower nature through which his spiritual ideals must rise to illumination and truth. The higher degrees of the mysteries took place in beautiful domed buildings where white-robed priests chanted and sang, and lights from invisible lamps shone on golden jewels. The greater mysteries represented the f felicity of the soul surrounded by light and truth. They symbolized that man had raised himself from the darkness of ignorance into the light of philosophy. Plato said that the body is the sarcophagus of the soul, for he realized that within the form was an immortal principle which could free itself from mortal sheath only by death or by initiation. By the ancients, these two were considered almost synonymous. For that reason, the dying Socrates ordered his disciples to make an offering at the time of his death similar to the one which candidates ma made when about to be initiated into the Eleusianian, Eleusianian mysteries. The mystery of the all-seeing eye was sometimes symbolized by the peacock because of the bird, this bird, had eyes in all of its feathers. In honor of the sacred eye, in the crown of the head, the monks of all nations shaved their heads over the place which it is supposed to look out. Small children who have but recently completed their embryonic recapitulation of humanity's early struggle for life have an unduly sensitive area above the crown of their head. The skull does not close there immediately in some cases, it never closes, although usually the sutures unite between the second and fifth years. The extreme sensitiveness over the area of the third eye is accompanied by a certain clairvoyance. The small child is still living largely in the invisible worlds, while the, its physical organism is unresponsive, it is conscious and active at least to a limited degree in these worlds with which it is connected by the open gateway of the pineal gland gradually certain manifestations of his higher consciousness enter into the physical organism and crystallize into the fine grit found in this gland there is no grit in the pineal gland until consciousness enters it. Not only are the two glands in the head tremendously important, but the whole glandular system, especially the ductless glandular system, exercises tremendous sway over the human system. The white blood corpuscles are not actually manufactured in either of the pancreas or the spleen but are really formed by activity of the etheric double, which is connected to the physical form through the spleen. A continuous stream of partly etheric white blood corpuscles poured from the invisible world into the visible organism through the gateway of the spleen. The same is true of the liver. For the red blood corpuscles are, to a certain degree, a crystallization of astral forces. For the liver is the portal leading into the astral body. 
The seven major ductless glands are under the control of the seven planets, and each one of them is actually a seven-fold body in the same way that all the vital organs are sevenfold. The heart is divided into seven complete organs by a certain process of occult anatomy, as is also the brain. The fact that the human brain closely resembles in certain details, especially the organs grouped about the base of it, an androgynous human embryo is sufficient to cause further investigation Sometimes physicians will realize that the knowledge of the organs and functions of the human body is the most important and complete method of understanding the religions of all the world. For all religions, even the most primitive, are based on the functions of the human form. It was not without reason that the ancient priests placed over the temple's gate the immortal motto, Man, know thyself. That, that makes you think of the old saying, true grit. He's got grit. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for being here on this journey. That was the end of Melchizedek Dick and the Mystery of Fire by Manly P. Hall. And it's worth a, a read to yourself if, you know, if you're feeling up to it. One love, one vibration. Thank you for watching Hidden Hand. One love, one vibration.